Oh, glory to God. Boy, that is so awesome. And that is the exact truth. God is our defense. And there's nothing else that's going to protect us from coronavirus or anything else. God fights for us. He always has. He's our victory. He's always been our victory. What, what a good, encouraging, boy, that's a good, encouraging song. And Justin, praise the Lord. That's an oldie but goodie, but man, that thing is great. And John and you guys, uh, man, it's so good to have you back. I've been missing you. I stood out there and was just singing at the top of my lungs. Could you guys hear me? I don't know. <laughs> I hope not. But, but anyway, uh, man, I was jumping all around. And I, it reminded me really of today's, uh, one of the scriptures in today's message about David worshiping the Lord, you know, with all of his might. And um, yeah, they, you have to be in shape to worship the Lord with all your might. I'm going to tell you that. That twirling and spinning and all of that singing and clapping and moving. Woo, you got to kind of, we got to kind of get back in shape for all of that. But uh, I praise the Lord. It, it really blessed my heart. And I, I look forward to you guys and all of us being back. And let me just say one thing about being back. I mean, I know, you know, we're waiting on, we're waiting on an okay. Uh, we're going to, we're good citizens and, and we obey our government. Um, and, and of course, you know, whether you think it's a little bit overbearing or not, or whatever the thoughts might be, um, you know, we're going to try to be safe. And I, we just don't want you guys to be afraid when you come back. Um, we know the virus is going to be out regardless of when we come back. So uh, we just want to make sure that that um, that you feel safe and that you'll come and be a part. So we, we're strategizing on some things. <clears throat> we may have to have two services so that we can have enough room to spread you out. And uh, we can do that for a little while and, and, until we feel safer about everything. And then we can kind of come back to one and, uh, and all enjoy it in here together and be together. And that'll be wonderful. For those of you that might be uh, with us for the first time, uh, you're not aware of what we're doing. Uh, we're, what we're doing now is uh, we're taking the life of King David, Israel's greatest king. And we're looking at his life, and, and from his life, we are discovering what made him great. You know, he's still considered after, uh, gosh, man, it's been almost 3,000 years since David ruled over Israel. And he's still considered the greatest king that Israel ever had. And he is the only king in the Bible that, that the scripture says that he was a man after God's own heart. And so what was it about David that made David so great? Well, we know it wasn't because he was sinlessly perfect because the Bible is filled with his indiscretions. I mean, my goodness, David, uh, I've said, said it to the church before. I said, I don't think any of you would want to be next door neighbor to, Je to David because boy, David, uh, if he moved in next door, you'd probably want to move out because uh, he had some real issues in his life and his family really had some issues in his life too. But... <clears throat> But he is called a man after God's own heart. So it couldn't be the fact that, you know, he's, he's known for being a giant killer. He's known for being a great warrior. He's known for being a great king. But, but is, that, is that what made David a man after God's own heart? Well, you know, obviously you know that's not it because there are other great warriors in the Bible and, and great rulers in the Bible and, and obviously uh, people that have done great things. But... But, but David is that man that God said, he's after my heart. And, and it was because basically, just basically it was because David had great respect for God and great love for God. Now you'll remember Saul, who was the first king of Israel, who, the, the king that David replaced. You know, Samuel comes and anoints him and he replaces Saul. Saul has been king in Israel for 40 years for 40 years, Saul has been king of Israel, and not one time in 40 years has Saul done anything to contact God, to get a word from God, to know what God wanted him to do, to pray with the people of a city. Everything that Saul has done in connection with anything spiritual in his life has been the exact opposite of that. It's been a total disrespect for God. He didn't wait for Samuel at the city. He went ahead and gave the sacrifice even though he wasn't a priest and he shouldn't have given it. And he, he just didn't have enough patience to wait and he didn't think it made any difference anyway. And he didn't obey Samuel when he told him to kill all the, the, uh, the Agites. And anyway, long stories. But, 
But the point is that Saul showed absolutely no respect or love for God. And as a matter of fact, the scripture says that while Saul was king, the ark of God, which we're going to do a great deal of talking about today, was never consulted about anything. When David was king every time, and even before David was king, and when, when Moses was leading the children of Israel through the wilderness, the ark of the covenant, which represented God in the midst of his people, boy, Moses got a word from God. He went before that ark, and, 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 and God spoke to him from there and gave him directions about things. And Joshua got a word about where to go, what to do, when to fight battles, all that. And David did the same thing, but Saul just, uh, he completely disregarded that. So the thing that made David a man after God's own heart is that David loved God and David respected God and David was not ashamed to worship God. David was Israel's only worshiping king. None of the others were ever worshipers of the Lord. And when we look at King David, we're looking at uh, a lot of example of what New Testament worship is like, much less the Old Testament law and so forth. And, and so David was the only worshiping king that Israel had. So he, he paid a, 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 a tremendous price. What, would it, what does it mean to be a man after someone's heart? Let me ask you, if someone was after your heart, what would that mean? What would they do to win your heart? This says David was a man after God's own heart. I think simply, you know, and we'll just boil, it could be several things, but just boil it down to this one kind of thought. If I was a man after your heart, it would be that I want to be with you because of who you are, not because of what you can do for me. I'm seeking you. I'm, 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 I'm desiring to be with you. I want you to be my friend and close to you, not because I think that there's a benefit for me and you can give me a lot of things. It's just because I care about you and I want to be close to you and you are important to me. So for that kind of attitude, for David's love for God, for his his worship of the Lord, David paid a great price. And we're going to look at it in a passage of Scripture, a chapter of Scripture. Oh, I see everybody getting nervous. All right, I'm going to try to get it down for you. But, but it's a whole chapter in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And it's a tremendous drama and a tremendous story of what David had to sacrifice to get this Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem so that, it, so that God could be worshiped in the midst of the city. And, um, and David becomes a great example of our fourth truth today. You remember the truths that we've learned so far? Number one, uh, uh, a great person becomes great where? Uh, sitting at home in a recliner? <laughs> a great person becomes great on the battlefield. That's where, that's where your greatness is, is placed in you, and that's where you earn your greatness is on the battlefield. The second uh, truth was nobody's perfect, so therefore a great person takes responsibility for the mistakes that they make and, they, and then grows from those mistakes. The third truth that we learned last week was everybody has pain, right? There's nobody on earth that doesn't have some kind of pain in their life. Well, great people are able to move past their pain in order to achieve God's destiny in their life. And let me just say to you, if you're going to be a great person, and remember we're talking about great people being people that accomplish the purpose of God in their life. I'm not talking about you being president of the United States or, or CEO of Ford or, or General Motors. I'm talking about accomplishing the purpose that God created you for. And if you do that and you leave God's mark in this world, then you're a great person. You might be, it might be a, to be a mom or to be a dad. It might be a, a, you know, to, to run a store or ha have a retail job. It might be to be a great neighbor. It, I mean, it could be lots of things in your life, but, but, but God says if you want to be great, there are some truths about greatness. And here's the fourth one today. This is the one we learned from in David's worship life. Every great person is a worshiper of God and pays the price to be so. Let me say it again. Every great person is a worshiper of God and pays a price to be so. 
In Acts chapter 15, there is a council that is, that is uh, meeting concerning what's going to happen with the gospel. The, 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 the Jewish believers, the Jewish Christians, uh, are, are wanting to know, do we, when we go out and, 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 and we start talking to the Gentiles, uh, what do we need to do with those guys? I mean, do those guys need to come under the law of Moses and start practicing the law? Because, you know, all of us did. Before, before we came to Christ, we all went to temple. We all obeyed the law. We gave the sacrifices. We were circumcised. We have, I mean, there are lots of Jewish things that happened to us. So do they need to have the same Jewish things happen to them that we had happen to us? And Paul was at this meeting, and James was at this meeting, and, and Barnabas was at this meeting, and Silas was at this meeting, and, and, and the rest of the apostles were there, and, and the church leaders were there. And they had a big argument, a big discussion about, about what, how, is, how is the church going to relate to the law, and are we going to put this law on believers and tell them they've got to do this in order to be saved and to come to Christ? And and, 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 and thank goodness the answer was no. Uh, Peter, Peter basically said, he said, look, why, why should we put more on them than we ourselves can do? Which I thought was a really good answer. But James summed up the meeting with this scripture. And I, I, I just wanted you to know that because this, this passage is very unusual. What James says at the end of this meeting it, it is just it, it's tremendous, but it's unusual. Listen to it. This is Acts 15, verse 15. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, and now he's going to quote a prophecy, an Old Testament prophecy from the book of Amos, chapter 9. Here it is. This is the Lord speaking. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. So here's the Lord speaking and James is quoting a prophet from the Old Testament that, that spoke a lot about the last days and about the days to come with the Messiah and all of the... And so James says, don't you guys remember what Amos said, right? That in the days when, when, when the Messiah has come and the Spirit is on this earth, that, that, that the prophet said that God said he was going to rebuild a tabernacle. But God didn't say, I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of Moses. The tabernacle of Moses was an impressive thing. It was, man, it was unbelievable. It was a, it, it had three structures, an outer wall, the skins, and a tent, a big tent in the middle that was divided into the Holy of Holies and the, and the, in the inner court, the front part of the court. It had, it had a, it had a brazen laver and a brazen uh, altar and it had a golden candlestick and a golden table of showbread and, and, and an altar of incense and, and, and then behind that second what curtain way back deep in there it had a piece of furniture called the Ark of the Covenant and the Ark of the Covenant was really two pieces it was a box by the way the word Ark means box Noah, Noah's boat was an Ark not because it's a boat not because an Ark is a boat but because Noah's boat was a box for safekeeping that kept eight people and all those animals safe for us so this ark was built and he gave direct dimensions and they put inside uh, the law that was broken and Aaron's rod that budded and a golden pot of manna. And then the second piece was a solid gold top that they covered it with so that all this broken law and all of this was covered with the mercy of God. And, and then they had cherubim angels on, the in, on each end with their wings stretching out over the, uh, over the top of this thing. And, and their wings almost met. It was just a tiny little crack between their wings. And God says, tell Israel if they want to see me, look at this piece of furniture. In other words, God said, build this piece of furniture and this piece of furniture is going to be me. If they want to know me, go to this piece of furniture. 
And God spoke to Moses from between the, the wings of those cherubim. The Spirit of God hovered above the wings right at the tip and, gave, and, and spoke to Moses from the Ark of the Covenant. Man, you guys, you've seen the Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? All right, that might not be totally exactly 100% va valid, but, it, but it's pretty close. And, and that was the piece of furniture that was hidden. And so God was hidden. In the tabernacle of Moses, God was hidden from everybody. Nobody could see God except the high priest only once a year. So, so God didn't say, you know, in those days, in those days where my spirit's poured out on the earth and I'm going to be doing great things on the earth, he, he didn't say, I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of Moses. And he didn't say, I'm going to rebuild the temple of Solomon. The Temple of Solomon was a massive structure, a, a, a massive feature in the city of Jerusalem. And it just replaced the tabernacle in a more elaborate way. But all it did with God is put God deeper away from the people of Israel. The rooms were bigger, the, the structure was more massive. The curtain that was in front of the Ark of the Covenant to keep the people out was as thick as a man's hand. So nobody could go in. Of course, it was for their protection, but still, God was separated. So all the way through the wilderness, if you were, if you were an Israelite and you went with God through the wilderness with Moses, you never saw God. Not one time did you see God. He was hidden behind a veil in the Holy of Holies. When, he, when, when they were carried from place to place, they covered the ark with a blue linen and an and a, and a animal skin so that the people carrying it couldn't even see the ark. And then in Solomon's temple, they hid him back away in a holy of holies, way back uh, with a curtain in front of him as, big, as thick as a, as a man's hand. So God says, I'll tell you what we're going to do. And, and, and I, we, we are going to... We, in the last days when I pour my spirit out, I'm going to rebuild a tabernacle. And you know what tabernacle is going to be? It's going to be the tabernacle that David built. Now, I bet many of you never even knew David built a tabernacle, right? You might not have ever even heard of the tabernacle of David. But David's tabernacle was very different. The tabernacle in the wilderness of Moses was all about religion. It was the epitome of religion. It was about law, it was about order, it was about performance. God was hidden in a holy of holies back there somewhere. You never got to see God. And the blood that was shed, it didn't take away sin. All it did was postpone your judgment for one year. Same thing with Solomon's temple. But with David's tabernacle, David's tabernacle was a simple tent, a one-room tent that David set up in the center of the city of Jerusalem it had four poles, single tent. He threw the flaps up on, si on the sides of the tent and he brought the Ark of the Covenant and he set the Ark of the Covenant right in the center of that little tabernacle. And the flaps stayed up so that anyone walking down the streets of Jerusalem, you didn't even have to be a Jew. You could be a Gentile. But you could stand on that street and you could look under that tent and you could see God for the very first time in the life of any Old Testament time. God had made himself available for the people to see. David even came in there and prayed, had prayer meetings around the ark. He assigned Levites, which were the tribe that took care of religious things and spiritual things in Israel. He assigned Levites to play musical instruments 24 hours a day, seven days a week under the tent around the ark. First time, first time music had ever been associated with anything to do with God. There was no music in the tabernacle. There was no, there was no, no music in the temple. There was no worship, there was no celebration, there was no joy, there was no praise. There was no, there was no elation about any of that. It was simply the law. Did you do it? Did you bring your sacrifice? Did you kill it? Did you get the blood? Did everybody confess their sin? And that's all it was about, was pure, unmitigated religion. 
When you were a Jew, if you went into the outer court of the tabernacle, the only thing there, two pieces of furniture, one was a, a brazen altar, a brass altar, which represents sin, and a brass laver where you could wash your hands before you went into the inner court. And that's where the people brought their animals in. So here, you're, you're a Jew, a typical Jew on the Day of Atonement, and, and here's what would be happening to you. You say, man, we got to go down to church. This is a day of atonement. Bless God, all our sins are going to get forgiven. Hallelujah. Come on, family. Confess your sins and let's go. Because I'm, to to I'm going to go down to the tabernacle and I'm going to put our sacrifice on the altar and, and God's going to forgive our sins and the high priest is going to take his little goat and kill the goat and run one away to call the scapegoat and then he's going to take this other one and he's going to take the blood and he's going to go into the Holy of Holies. He's going to sprinkle it and God's going to, God's going to be all right with us for the next year. It'd be like Easter on steroids for the Jewish people. Great day, happy day, beautiful day. Let me tell you what you'd experience. Here's what you'd experience. You'd walk down the tabernacle, you'd go inside the gate, and inside the gate would be the, you'd look right over to your left, and there would be the brazen altar, and the labor would be right behind it, and right over there, there'd be lines, people in line, and they'd have their sacrifice, their bulls, their goats, <laughs> their calves, their sheep, whatever they were gonna sacrifice. And the only thing you would hear would be the bleeding and the screaming and the yelling and the blaying of animals having their throats cut and dying. And the only thing that you would smell would be burning flesh and burning hair. That's religion. Nothing uplifting, nothing joyful, nothing satisfying, nothing liberating, nothing freeing in life. Just get it over with and let's do it and go on so we can go on for another year. So God said, in the days when my spirit pours on this earth and people are coming to me, I'm going to, you know what I'm going to rebuild? I'm going to rebuild that tabernacle of David. Because that tabernacle of David is what I want. I want to be exposed to the people. I want the people to see me. I want the people to be able to come to me on their own. Not through a priest, a pope, or a pappy, but on their own. To choose me, to come to me. But before David could build a tabernacle and put it in the center of the city, he had to get it back to the city. Now this was <laughs> a little an adventure in itself. <laughs> and this is where that fourth truth comes from that says every great person is a worshiper of God. Listen, I don't know how you are in your worship. I, 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 I'm telling you, I used to be bound up. I, I, I did. I mean, I've been in the ministry for 40, uh, what, three, four years. And I'm going to tell you, I, I've pastored denominational churches all my life. Now, I'm not blaming it on my denomination. I'm, I'm just saying that I was in that kind of an environment. I love, my, I love the people that brought, brought me to the Lord, the people that trained me and taught me. I mean, I am what I am because of what they put in me and what they showed me there were great. I'm not complaining about that at all. I'm just saying that for me to become a worshiper, I had to break down some walls in my own life. I had to, I had to conquer some things in my life in order to worship God like he says I should do with all of my heart, with all of my mind, with all of my soul, and with all of my strength. That's what we're supposed to worship God with. Jesus said it, those four elements of our life. So, I, so to worship the Lord doesn't simply mean that I dance a jig, or I bow on my knees, or I lift my hands, or I clap, or I go, glory to God! Worship is all of that. My mind is involved. My, my, my soul is involved. My spirit is involved. My body is involved. My life is involved. It is a totally enveloping experience to worship the Lord. And no person is going to become everything God has created them to be if they can't worship the Lord. 
and be expressive to him, not bound up, you know, to, 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 feel, to feel like you love someone, but, but you can't show it. That, that's a bondage, isn't it? I mean, really, isn't that a bondage? That's something that needs to be broken loose out of life. So David paid a great price to become a worshiper of the Lord, and it's a great story, and, and, and I want to share it with you. And let me, let me just start, and, and obviously I'm not going to be able to do this. <laughs> I'm probably already late. But um, let, me just get, let me just tell you what, where, what's happening as David prepares to, to get the show on the road to get this ark to Jerusalem. The Ark, the ark of, the, of the Covenant traveled with the tabernacle. It was considered to be God. It was carried into every battle as Israel faced their enemies. It was looked at by the enemies of God as being their magic charm. You know, all the enemies of God back then, they had their own gods. They had the gods they served and worshiped, and this was Israel's God. That's the way they looked at it. This is Israel's God. And every time Israel w would win a battle, the, 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 uh, the other nations around them would become more respectful to that, to that ark uh, that ark right there, that box right there. Uh, that thing is powerful. When it shows up on a battlefield, Israel, you know, kicks behind. That's all I'm going to tell you. When you see that thing coming out on the field, you might as well take off running because when that thing gets there, Israel's God is going to whip something up. And it was looked at, at it that way. But then, uh, while Saul was pursuing David and trying to kill David, you remember the story, David played the harp for him and, and tried to soothe him and all that, and then Saul got jealous of him, and David got anointed as a young man by Samuel to be the future king of Israel, and, and, uh, and, and he was playing for Saul, and Saul got jealous and started throwing spears at him, trying to kill him and all that kind of stuff, and then Saul, then Saul started pursuing David to try to kill David. Just jealous, green-eyed monster of jealousy, just, just irrational, uh, demon-possessed. And, and so... The ark, the, the, the ark got left at a place called Amenadab's house. And it's not really important that you remember that, but just remember that for 20 years, for 20 years the ark sat at, Abena, at Amenadab's house and his son Eliezer took care of the ark. So it's just sitting up there on the hill at Amenadab's house uh, for 20 years. Well, when David becomes king of, of Israel, he becomes king at Judah first, and, and then after seven years, he becomes king of Israel also. And, and now he's the king of Israel and Judah. They're, they're together. And, and so David says, let's make the capital Jerusalem. And, and then God put into his heart, uh, you know, we need the ark here. See, Saul, did, Saul didn't care about the ark. Saul never tried to move the ark. Saul never did anything with the ark because Saul didn't even care. God, I mean, God was an afterthought to Saul. That's why, that's why God removed him. You know, he's half-hearted, arrogant, doesn't really think about God. He's not a man after God's own heart. And so God says, all right, you, you're gone. And David, you, you're after my heart. You come in. And, and, and so when David got in Jerusalem and made it the capital, he said, you know what we need to do? We need to get the ark back to Jerusalem. So David said, where, where is that thing, by the way? And uh, somebody said, well, it's out at Amenadab's house out there in the country. Uh, it's about, just for your sake to know, it's, about, it's right about nine and a half miles roughly from Jerusalem is where it was sitting, about nine and a half miles. That is out there in Amenadab's house. And David said, well, let's go out there and get it because I want to bring it back into, into, into Israel. The reason it was there was because that's where the Philistines, <laughs> this will take a second, but it's really kind of cute, actually. The Philistines were, bad, were constant enemies with Israel. You know this, right? You hear their names all the time. Well, the, Philist the Philistines were in a battle with Israel and Saul was leading the army and uh, they, got, they got beat real bad and the ark wasn't with them. And so a couple of reprobate preacher's boys named uh, Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's sons, reprobates, uh, had sex on the altar in the temple, ate the meat sacrificed on the temple uh, and Eli did nothing to control them. And they, in any way, they said, well, we need to go get the ark. 
because that ark will help us. And they went and they got the ark and they brought it out on the field and they took it out and, and they battled the Philistines again and the Philistines whipped the fire out of them and, 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 and took the ark away from them. And the Philistines said, hot dog, I, we got the ark. This is that great God. Who are we going to have the power of that great God? And so they took the ark and they put it in the temple of one of their gods, a god named Dagon. Dagon is that, is that god that has a, 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 a body that looks like a kind of a regular person and then he has the head, looks like a German shepherd head on him. So they took the ark and they put it in the temple of Dagon. Dagon is a statue sitting up here and they put the ark right down there in front of Dagon. And they came back the next morning and Dagon was turned over with his face down in the, in the sand right in front of the ark, like he's worshiping the ark. And, it, and, then, and then the Philistine says, well, we need to get him set back up. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to worship a God that I got to prop up. Would you? I mean, really. I mean, that kind of would be a red flag for me, right? You know, I've got, I got to pick him up and put him back up. But anyway, so they, the, the second night, they left the ark right there. They said, oh, well, Dagon fell down. And so we're going to put it up. So they put him up. And the second morning they came in there, Dagon was laying on the floor again. This time his head was knocked off and his hands were knocked off. And then the people of the town that they were in began to get tumors all over their bodies. It says, the Bible puts it very delicately, it says, and they began to get tumors in their private places. And then rats invaded the city. So they had a gigantic rat infestation. So they took the ark to another city and, and, and similar things happened there. Took it to another city, similar things happened. Now they've got three cities that are just being terrorized by the ark. And they, they say, man, we got to get that thing back. We got to get it back because that God's mad. And, and so the question then became, how are we going to do it? Because we can't take it down the road. If we do, if we take it, then when Israel sees us, they're going to kill us. So what they decided to do was to build a brand new wooden cart, like a little cart, and hook two milk cows to it. And the two milk cows had calves and they put them in a stall over there so hopefully the mamas would come back when they deliver the ark. And, and they put the ark on that cart and they put a bag of five tumors, replicas of these tumors made out of gold. Put a bag of it on there. Made, made, got another bag, made five replicas of those rats that were inhabiting the city, put a bag on there. This was, this was their offering for causing Israel so much trouble. They said, look, we need to put a peace offering on there and, and, and this will just be an apology. I'm sorry we ever took it to start with. Please accept our apology. And then, and then shooed the milk cows and they went right down the road toward Israel. Well, when they got to the county line of Israel, Israel, uh, some men of Israel were, were looking down the road and they saw that cart coming and they said, that's, that's, that looks like the ark and, and the milk cow, what? And they waited until it crossed the county line and when, the, and when, the, when they crossed the county line, they got the cows, they took the cart and they chopped the wood up and made a fire and they made burnt offering out of the cows and they took the ark and they put it, on, they put it you know, out in the field while they were doing all this sacrifice and burnt offering stuff. And, and one of them decided he wanted to look in the ark. How many of you saw on Raiders of the Lost Ark, you don't want to look in the ark, right? Bad stuff happens. Well, that's what happened. Killed, killed 50 men right there in that field and 70 oxen dead right there on the spot. Of course, they become fearful of it and they don't even want to touch it anymore. And, they, and, and, and somebody said, where can we go? And they said, get up there. I said, Eliezer uh, uh, is uh, Aminadab's son. He's handled the ark before. He's, he's a Levite. Get him. And they took the ark up and put it at Aminadab's house. And that's where the ark had been sitting for, for the past 20 years. And David said, we need to get the ark into Jerusalem. 
Because if we can get the ark into Jerusalem, God's blessings will prosper the city of Jerusalem, the whole nation of Israel. But it's going to cost something for David to do this. Just like it cost us to become worshipers of God. It might be our pride. It might be our, our, our time. It might, be, it might be a crucifixion of, of some attitudes that are on the inside of us. Somebody might laugh at us. Somebody, somebody might think that we're holy rollers and that we're Jesus freaks and fanatics. There might be some social rejection attached to this. There may be misunderstandings. You have to prepare yourself. It takes time to worship the Lord. You have to seek God to worship the Lord. Worshiping the Lord is not just walking into a sanctuary and a praise band begins to play and you just begin to, you know, raise your hands and, and wor worship. Worship is a personal thing. Worship is a relational thing. And it's vital to any follower of Christ. If you want to if you want to accomplish your God-given destiny. And so, I wish I had time for the rest, but I'm sorry. Can you come back next week? <laughs> uh, can you come back? Oh, it is a, ooh, this story right here. It'll make what I've just said in the last seven or eight minutes, 10 minutes, seem like a Sunday school picnic. It, it's unbelievable. This is the most dramatic story you've ever heard in your life. And it's a price that we must pay. So anyway, come back. Let's bow in a word of prayer.